Guess who won Miss Photogenic in the recent Miss Teen Big 2016? May May Intrada was awarded Miss Photogenic at the first ever Miss Teen Big 2016 pageant against four candidates for her photos that captivated netizens on Facebook. Intrada won after she got the most number of voters in Pinoy Big Brother's Facebook poll. The wacky go lucky of Kagan the aura was also named Miss Congeniality as voted by her fellow contestant. Another special awards handed out ahead of the announcement of the pageant's winner on Sunday are Best in Long Gown which went to Stephanie Vez, Best in Sportswear which went to Kisses Delavan, and Best in Talent which went to Vivri Esclito. The preparation for the in-house beauty contest started last Saturday to boost the confidence and determination of the remaining female housemates in Bahia Nikuya. Big Brother had to compete them against Brazilian models Vaz and Maria Fabiana for the challenge. At stake is the housemates' budget for additional food and other supplies in the coming week and a chance at immunity from eviction. If the Brazilian models win, they will choose who among the remaining housemates will be safe for at least another week. In a previous episode, Intrada broke down in tears after seeing the result of her first ever professional photo shoot. Invite you to watch the video. Why Drug Raid Over Islamic Center in Carapo, 7 Executed and 263 Arrested A wide anti-illegal drug operation took place in Manila Islamic Center in Carapo, Mania last October 7 which resulted to 7 being executed and 263 drug traffickers captured by authorities. Islamic centers were blocked by different law enforcement groups such as the Manila Police District, MPD. Special Weapons and Tactics Team Special Operations Unit, Tactical Motorcycle Response, National Capital Region Police Office, NCRPO, Highway Patrol Group and the Special Action Force. According to Phil Starr, MPD Director Senior Superintendent Joel Napoleon Coronel said that they made sure that all entry and exit points in the Islamic Center are secured before they went into the place by 9.30 a.m. Barangay 648 Chairman Faiz Makabato was wiped out by authorities after fighting back after authorities filed a warrant of arrest. Makabato is one of the high-value targets of the police that if caught, a reward will be given. Six more were executed and 263 were arrested including the suspected commander of the Bank Samro Islamic Freedom Fighters. High-caliber weapons, grenades and 60 sackets of shabu were recovered. It was the only the second drug raid that happened in the Islamic Center. The first raid happened during former President Ferdinand Marcos' time. Invite you to watch the video. Justin, two were killed and one was injured in the SM Daz Marina's hostage-taking incident. The hostage-taker and one of his hostages were among the casualties of the horrifying hostage-taking incident in SM Daz Marina's on Sunday afternoon, October 9, 2016. The former KVI governor, John Vic Rimola stated that the hostage-taker was identified as the 32-year-old Carlos Marcos Lactal who tooled 12 people inside one of the mall's restrooms at around 11 in the morning, using a 12-inch knife. Rimola stated that the man was looking for his wife and her alleged lover. Initial reports say that Lactal was in a love triangle with his wife and another lover that led him to committing such crime. Reports say that nine hostages were able to safely escape from the crisis, while Lakdal stabbed two of them, one of them died due to severe injury. The hostage-taking incident ended at around 2.55 p.m. when the authorities shot him that ended his life. They also stated that when they shot the suspect, he's still holding a hostage that was identity. Ed, as Mylene Balajadia who was not hurt but is expected to be traumatized by what she had experienced. The local PNP and our security are working together to manage the situation. All tenant personnel and customers are all safe and away from the area, SM Senior Vice President for Investor and Relation, Cora Gitt said. Reports claim that Lakdao is one of the mall's employee but then Cora Gitt stated that he is not in any way affiliated with the establishment. Invite you to watch the video. More than 10,000 contractual employees bid goodbye to Endo after they were regularized under Duterte administration, reports has just revealed that more than 10,000 contractual employees were already regularized by their employers. It was stated that it about 195 campaigners have volunteered to regularize the 10,532 workers. 
we continue to encourage employers to voluntarily regularize workers who are under labor-only contracting arrangements, said Bellow in a press conference for the first 100 days of the Duterte administration. Reports also stated that the convenience store 7-Eleven has already regularized 800 workers. SM malls have regularized 4,796 while Rustin's regularized 1,200 employees. Young cease and desist order, from its very implication, Ebig Sabi Hinpine Hinto Naman Young Operations NG Campania or Kaya in order Naman Young Asang Agencia or Manpower Service Ahuag Munasila Mag Deploy. Young cease and desist order is already a form of sanction, Bello said. All regional offices have been directed to suspend the certificates of registration of establishments found violating the law of security of tenure, he added. Labor Under Secretary Duminador Say also said KPAG Hindi Silent not will comply, that will be tantamount to failing the assessment. In which case, Ankanalang preventive suspension can worsen to a cancellation of registration. And worst case scenario is MAG Close Shop Young Campania. Unless they will close, these contractuals will graduate into regular employees, Bello said. Invite you to watch the video. Agata Cedro slams Dudert, calls the president a psychopath. Actress Agata Cedro slams Dudert over the president's latest tirades against the United States and the European Union. In a Facebook post, Agata Cedro called President Dudert a psychopath after the president dares the US and EU to withdraw their support to the Philippines. The actress pointed out that no one is making issues with Dudert that the president is the one who's making conflicts. Agata Cedro said that Dudert is acting like the Philippines is a powerful country. She also suggests the president to see a psychiatrist. Here's what the actress have to say about the issues surrounding U.S., EU and President Dudert. What can you say about Agata Cedro's remarks about President Rodrigo Dudert? Share your views and opinion on the comment section below. Invite you to watch the video. The sexual harassment allegations against Bill Clinton, explained, on Sunday night, with fewer than two hours to go before the second presidential debate, Donald Trump appeared on Facebook Live with four women who have accused Bill and or Hillary Clinton of wronging them, Juanita Broderick, who claims Bill Clinton raped her in 1978 and Hillary then intimidated her, Kathy Shelton, who was raped at 12, and whose rapist was represented in court by Hillary Clinton. Kathleen Willey, who accused Bill Clinton of groping her in 1993, and Paula Jones, who accused then-Gov Clinton of exposing himself to her in 1991, Trump, like many in the press, has effectively equated these four women's claims. But they are rather different. On one extreme, Shelton's accusations amount to blaming Clinton for representing her client adequately in court, a client to whom she was assigned to represent and did not choose. There's no wrongdoing there. On the other extreme, Broderick has a serious and credible accusation against Bill Clinton, though the evidence that Hillary was involved is weaker. And the sexual harassment accusations of Jones and Willie Well, they're complicated. Jones's claims are serious if true, but have been largely shown to be false. Basically, Jones alleged that Bill Clinton had a distinguishing mark on his penis that both doctors and Monica Lewinsky said he did not have that cast doubt on whether the incident happened as she alleged it did. Willie's accusation is less clearly fallacious, but several factors cast serious doubt on it, and it's overall much less credible than Broderick's. Paula Jones is perhaps best known today for initiating the 1994 lawsuit against the president set the stage for Clinton's impeachment. It was in a Jones case deposition that Clinton claimed under oath to have never had sex with Monica Lewinsky setting up a perjury prosecution. Jones alleged that in 1991, when she worked for the State of Arkansas Industrial Development Commission, Clinton propositioned her and exposed himself at a conference in Little Rock. Clinton, Jones claimed, beckoned her to a suite at the hotel where the conference was being held, and after a few minutes of conversation, unexpectedly reached over to me, took my hand, and pulled me toward him, so that our bodies were close to each other. Clinton then, she said, made a number of sexual comments, I love your curves, slid his hand up her thigh, and tried unsuccessfully to kiss her on the neck until she stopped him. Jones claims she asked, what are you doing? And walked away from Clinton, and tried to change the conversation, after which Clinton walked back toward her, 
lowered his trousers and underwear, exposed his penis, which was erect, and told me to kiss it. Jones rejected the overture, to which he claims Clinton replied, I don't want to make you do anything you don't want to do. Before she left, she claims Clinton added, you are smart. Let's keep this between ourselves. The lawsuit dragged on for years, generating reams of testimony, but eventually Federal District Court Judge Susan Weber Wright granted summary judgment in Clinton's favor, saying that even if the events alleged transpired, they did not amount to sexual assault and that Jones had no evidence she'd been punished or emotionally afflicted in the workplace for rebuffing the governor. Jones's side appealed to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, after which Clinton and Jones came to a settlement in which she was paid $850,000, all but $200,000 of which went to her legal fees, but Clinton admitted no wrongdoing. Neither the settlement nor Wright's judgment tells us much about the validity of Jones's underlying complaint. The witnesses corralled by Jones and Clinton's legal teams, however, are somewhat informative. Jones and her lawyers offered two witnesses to corroborate the events. Pamela Blackard, who had been working with Jones at the registration desk for the conference, said she noticed Clinton starting intently at Jones before the incident, heard a state trooper tell Jones that the governor wanted to see her, and spoke to a shaking Jones about what had happened immediately afterward, though it was later revealed that Jones only told Blackard the most salacious parts of the allegation days after the fact, not immediately. Jones's friend, Deborah Ballantini, claimed that Jones showed up unannounced at Ballantini's office later that day and recounted the story. But multiple other witnesses suggested that Jones was, to the contrary, elated by her interaction with Clinton. Pam Hood, a co-worker of Jones's, told The New Yorker's Jane Mayer in 1997 that the meeting sparked a bubbly enthusiasm in Jones similar to her demeanor after seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger visiting Little Rock. Carol Phillips a switchboard operator at the governor's office, said Jones had a happy and excited manner in describing her meeting with Clinton, who Jones called gentle, nice, and sweet. In 1994, her sister and brother-in-law, Charlotte and Mark Brown, told Sidney Blumenthal, then a New Yorker reporter, that Jones was suing Clinton for the money, and that, Paula's suing over a stupid lie, and she knows it. Unlike the Broderick case, the Jones case also has some physical evidence involved. Kind of. Jones gave an account of what the president's penis looked like that was then thoroughly discredited, which is perhaps the strongest reason to think her whole accusation is false. Daniel Trailer, the first lawyer who Jones hired for the case, told Mayer that Jones never told him that Clinton's penis had specific distinguishing characteristics, a notorious detail in her allegation. Jones's later lawyer suggested that Trailer just hadn't asked the right questions to get his client to reveal that detail, but there's plenty of reason to think it was an after-the-fact embellishment. Clinton's personal lawyer, Robert S. Bennett, got sworn statements from three doctors denying any abnormalities in terms of size, shape, direction, or whatever Bennett felt a devious mind might suspect, Bob Woodward writes in his book Shadow. A thorough dermatological examination disclosed no blemishes, no moles, no growths. Eventually, it became clear that Jones specifically meant that Clinton's penis was crooked or bent when erect. But in a Q&A with prosecutors before her grand jury appearances, Monica Lewinsky specifically disputed Jones's description of Clinton's penis. Evidence from confidential sources now establishes with near certainty that the alleged distinguishing characteristic described by Paula Jones at the time of her encounter with then-Governor Clinton in 1991 did not exist, as an anatomical matter, writes Duquesne University's Ken Gormley in The Death of American Virtue, his definitive history of the Clinton impeachment. Thus, at least one key aspect of Ms. Jones's account is not corroborated by medical sources or individuals who would have had an ample opportunity to observe that trait if it had existed. Kathleen Willey's accusations of sexual assault against Clinton are less serious in nature than Broderick's, and received less coverage than Jones's. Given the number of factors casting doubt on her claims, that relative obscurity is probably justified. Willey was in 1993 a volunteer in Clinton's White House having met him at a 1989 campaign event for Virginia Lieutenant Governor Douglas Wilder's successful gubernatorial run. 
Both Willie and Clinton agree that on November 29, 1993, they had a private meeting in the Oval Office. Willie was in financial turmoil and was seeking a permanent paid position. But Willie additionally claims that at the end of the meeting, as they reached the door of the Oval Office, Clinton ran his hands through her hair, kissed her, and fondled her. Willie told several people about the incident shortly after it occurred. Ruthie Eisen, who formerly volunteered at the White House too, said that Willie told her about the incident the afternoon or evening of the day it happened. Willie's friend Diane Martin said that Willie called her and told her the day of the incident. Willie's friend Linda Tripp, yes, that Linda Tripp, also said Willie told her shortly after the alleged assault. Tripp, however, also claimed that Willie had a romantic interest in Clinton, which contradicted Willie's testimony. Willie's friend Julie Hyatt Steele also tried to back up the claim, initially telling Newsweek's Michael Isikoff that Willie informed her the night of the incident, but she later reversed herself and said that she lied to Isikoff because Willie told her to. Eventually independent counsel Kenneth Starr indicted Steele with lying to a grand jury and to the FBI about the case. The case ended in a mistrial. But Willie was not a particularly reliable source for Starr's office. In a deposition for the Paula Jones case, she said that she could not recall if Clinton successfully kissed her, and said that he hadn't followed her. In her grand jury testimony, however, she insisted he fondled her and kissed her. She also claimed in the deposition that she never spoke to anyone besides Steele, Isikoff, and her attorney Dan Gecker about the details of the encounter, throwing doubt on Eisen, Martin, and Tripp's attempts to corroborate her allegations. Willie also lied to FBI agents about her ex-boyfriend, and confessed to having lead when confronted with evidence contradicting her statements. But because Willie had been given an immunity deal by the independent counsel, she couldn't be charged with making false statements. Starr's office eventually concluded, the evidence was insufficient to prove to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that the president's deposition testimony about his conduct with Willie was false, and that, even assuming Willie's testimony was truthful about the incident with President Clinton, her testimony at trial would be subject to further challenge based on the differences between her deposition and grand jury statements, as well as her acknowledgement of false statements to the Office of the Independent Counsel. Beyond Starr's conclusions, an investigation by the Nation reporters Florence Graves and Jacqueline Sharkey found that six people said that Willie told them about the encounter with Clinton and was thrilled with it and perhaps actively seeking an affair with the president. This is a demo of the voice text English TTS system. Willie contacted Lynn Nesbitt, a New York literary agent, at least two months before going public with her story. Willie repeatedly withheld information from judges in the Jones case about her cooperation with Jones's attorneys. In an earlier case involving a $274,000 debt she was trying to avoid repaying, Willie made a number of misleading or evasive statements under oath. Since the end of the impeachment saga, Willie has taken on a career as a right-wing conspiracy theorist of some note. Her 2007 autobiography argued that her husband, who committed suicide on the same day she alleges that Clinton fondled her, was murdered on the orders of the Clintons, a claim she supported by drawing parallels to the death of Vince Foster a White House deputy counsel whose suicide many right-wing conspiracists have argued was actually a Clinton-ordered murder. Willie currently runs an anti-Clinton site called A Scandal a Day, and serves as national spokesperson for Women Against Hillary, a PAC organized by longtime conservative hatchet man and conspiracy theorist Roger Stone. Of course, only Kathleen Willie and Bill Clinton know what actually happened. But Willie's credibility is lacking, to say the least, given how frequently she contradicted herself, lied to investigators, and baselessly accused the Clintons of murder. Thank you for watching videos, you remember the likes and comments below, thanks.